coming this evening. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Peterson. I'm the director of the museum. And I know this is a gorgeous sunny day. It's kind of difficult to get yourself inside. If only if it were pouring out. But um, it's, it's the kind of day, I have to tell you, knowing what we were doing tonight, all I could do was drink in the beauty of this place and Brookhaven and this campus and, and everything my eyes could see and, and kind of ponder that today. Um, I have a, um, a little spot on City Cafe on WABE tomorrow. So if you listen in either at 90.1 or um, streaming live at uh, wabe.org, uh, Kate Sweeney was here when we opened and interviewed uh, Ken Katara and, and Billy, and Lori weren't there, unfortunately, but uh, I'm not sure. She was here for two and a half hours for a five-minute spot, so I'm really not sure what, she's gonna, what they're going to say about Oglethorpe. But if you listen in, uh, that's tomorrow at noon. Okay. Um, I also want to mention that we have a whole series of lectures for those of you who are, I can see you've got some uh, Lori and Billy fans here, but <laughs> we also have other lectures happening with our own Mike Rulison, a professor of physics, and with uh, Sidney Perkowitz, who's a retired um, Emory uh, physicist. Um, some great stuff, um, Painting in the Dark by Alan Eddy, who is a legally blind artist whose work is in the other gallery. And uh, Marcia Cohen is next week, and she teaches at SCAD. Um, and ironically enough, she was Alan Eddy's professor years ago when he was at the Atlanta College of Art. Um, let's see. Gosh, there's so much to say about you guys. I couldn't really narrow it down. But let me start by just saying these folks are amazing. I met them through Sandy Kleinman here um, uh, at OU. And uh, she suggested that I have a look at Blind Sight, and I'm really glad we did. Um, Blind Sight inspired the other show, Optic Chiasm, which was part of the very first Atlanta Science Festival. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, <laughs> Billy and, and, and uh, Lori worked with me on this beautiful catalog for our Jiki Tahanga uh, Japanese porcelain print show. And I saw firsthand what consummate professionals and yet unbelievably easygoing they both are. <laughs> and I don't know how you do that. I have no idea. Um, the late, great Christopher Reeve said about Billy, uh, what Howard sees through his lens again and again is the amazing resiliency of the human spirit. And I understand that this is not your first encounter with people with disabilities. He's done all kinds of work with people living with AIDS and with the Carter Center. And Lori, you have as well designed books with the Carter Center, um, yeah. with CDC, with a, a number of different places. They've traveled extensively. We're very lucky to have them right here in town. I'll stop talking. <laughs> Billy, Billy Hour and Lori Shock. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth, for wanting to have this exhibit, and John Over for having us uh, having us at the museum because it is really a fabulous museum. Uh, I don't know whether all of you have been here before, but we think it's a treasure, and we, we really enjoyed our association with it. Uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, how this project began, what our motivations were, and how we got started, and then um, Laurie's going to talk to you a little bit about the process that you know, she went through and coming up with illustrations that would mimic what people that are blind, visually impaired see. But we have a friend that um, I've known for 30 years, Laurie's known um, for about 15 years, that, that when I met him, began to lose uh, his eyesight, his vision. And I've watched him over the last 30 years go from a pretty highly functioning, visually impaired person to not being able to see um, much at all. And his photograph is in here, I'll point it out in a second. And you can see from his uh, illustration that Laurie did uh, how limited his vision is now. And through that process, uh, watched him go through a lot with a lot of grace and dignity and at times a lot of anger and depression. And eventually getting to the point where he, he could no longer get along on his own and he got a guide dog, which changed his life. So that was, uh, that was an amazing time to see him go through that and the excitement of that. He's on his second dog now, Santiago, who um, when Phil is uh, depressed or down or grumpy or, or grouchy, we still like to be around him because we like his dog so much. <laughs> Anything. But, but we, his wife, um, has been a fundraising uh, nonprofit uh, executive in the city for a lot longer than that. I've known, known her for 30 years as well through uh, Emory, and she was at the CDC Foundation. And then an opportunity came up at the Center for the Visually Impaired, and she, she jumped at it. She had been in national organizations with international scope, 
but she took the opportunity to be with the Center for the Visually Impaired because of how vision had impacted her life and how she knew that uh, people with vision impairments needed an advocate. And one of the things that we told her when she took that job is that we wanted to do something that we could to help her get her message out. And so we, we talked about it for about a year and Laurie and I kept coming up with ideas and finally fine-tuned it to what, we, what you see up on these walls. And then Subi and the Center for the Visually Impaired helped us, helped us identify initially 12, now we've got 14, but we're going to add to that. Um, as a matter of fact, Alan Eddy, the artist in there, um, has, has been through CBI and he's going to participate too, so he'll be one of our next people that we photograph. And we identified people, we, we had a, a, a challenge of diversity. And in everything that I do, you know, it's like I want to get diversity of, you know, ethnic diversity and uh, gender diversity. But in the case of this particular exhibit, we also, we needed all of that. We needed age diversity, gender diversity, ethnic diversity, and we also needed vision diversity. So within the people you see on the walls, there are a diversity of different visual issues that um, Laurie has spent a great deal of time researching, studying, and visualizing. She can tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so that's basically the motivation that we went through to um, begin this project and work on it, and, and we made some some real discoveries in the process. And what I always, I've, I've worked with people with disabilities and, and illness is basic, uh, that's kind of the gist of the kinds of work that I do for my projects. And I'm always amazed at how they break down whatever preconceived notions, stereotypes that I've ever had. And this was no different. And we, we learned a lot about vision and about people and about um, the human spirit basically through, through this process. So it was a real gift to us. And I'll let you um, take it from there okay. and, and start okay. our applying. Um, I've worked on a lot of projects, and this one was um, particularly close to my heart. Um, one of the most important to me that, that I've worked on. Um, and the thought of trying to simulate what someone's visual experience is um, is kind of daunting to think about. And, you know, probably I knew that I couldn't get exactly what their experience was, but um, being a, an artist, I didn't want anything stylistically to be included. I just wanted it to be as pure and as clear as I could to what their experience might be, because I knew how important it could be to their family members um, and also to their doctors and physicians who care for them. Um, and the reason I know that is because 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with two detached retinas in both my eyes at the same time. And I had laser surgery, and I found out around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and by 5 o'clock I was having laser surgery to try to tap the retinas up. And it wasn't successful in my right eye. So I had to then undergo um, surgery where they took a scleral bubble, and they put it on the back of my retina, and it's squeezing right now my retina in place so that I could see. And so for six weeks I was blind. I was basically blind in both eyes. And I didn't know how much was going to come back. Um, as an artist, that's really frightening. Um, I got about 80% of my vision back, not, not all of it. I have some ongoing distortion issues. Um, depth perception issues. Um, I have a um, little corner down here in my right eye that's just gone. There's no vision there. And so being an artist, I, when I was meeting with my doctors, I was constantly telling them what it was like, you know, what I was seeing. I was describing in great detail. Well, this is like this, and I'm seeing these flashing lights, and, and, and the vision is gone here, and I just, I just bombarded them with detail. And they aren't used to getting that. You know, they spend a great deal of their time desperately trying to diagnose and slow the process of your vision loss, hopefully stop it. Um, but they don't know exactly what each experience is for each person. And there are um, simulators on websites. Um, I even brought 
smoothies. There are glasses that you can get that show you what it's like if you have um, retinitis pigmentosa or glaucoma or just various things. But these, are, these aren't really representative. Through my experience, this is what I found. They're not representative of each person's experience. It's very different and very unique for every person. And so that made it even more important that I try to capture for each person um, what that's like. And the process that I went through was I sat down with each person and I, I asked them to describe what their visual experience was because almost everybody who's considered you know, blind has a visual experience. Not everybody, but most everybody. And so I would ask them to describe it in their words and then I would ask them, you know, okay, I'm sitting here and we have a light on, what, what can you see? Is it, do you have contrast? Can you see where something begins and ends? Can you see where my arm is ending here? Can you see color in my shirt? Can you see detail? Can you see my nose? And I would just ask them, and then I would pull up objects, and then we'd change the light, and I would ask them about texture and grain, and um, all of that, so that I could, and then I'd take notes, and then um, I would go back and I'd ask them for more detail. So that was basically the process, you know, since some of these um, people that we interviewed have um, a good amount of vision, I was able to take drawings back and sketches back to them and say, okay, how does this look, you know, if I got the color right? And, and they'd say, oh, you know, it's blurrier over there, or here I've got a big gray area in my vision, so can you add that in? Or, um, Luke, in Luke's case, he said, you know, I've got this weird pixelization right here. Can you add that in? And so it was really gratifying to be able to have that interaction with them and then see the progress and then, you know, and, and then have them say, yeah, that's it. That's, that's what I'm looking at. That's what I'm seeing. And the other thing that I did was I tried to ask them about their lives and, you know, what did they do? What was their family like? You know, what did they do for fun? What was their social life like? Because when I did choose subjects and scenes, I wanted it to be representative of what they might actually see in their life. So for Raina, she loved her dog. And so I, you know, I found this dog and I wanted that to be the focal point of how she might see her dog. So that brings me. So that's kind of an overview of why this was important, how I approached it, and how I interviewed the subjects. Um, and now I think, unless you have something... No, well, one of the things I was going to say, another part of this project that's not clearly visible, so to speak, is uh, you'll see the QR codes on each of the uh, sets of panels. One of our challenges was that we didn't want to create an uh, exhibit that was just about people that are visually impaired. We wanted it to be an exhibit that was about and for people that are visually impaired. And that is a challenge for a two-dimensional art show. When you see art exhibits that are geared towards the visually impaired they and the blind, they tend to be tactile, sculptural exhibits that involve touching. But we can do that with photographs and illustrations. So we employed, we, we found a woman who volunteered to work with us whose expertise was in audio descriptions. There's a whole field of people that do audio descriptions for people that are visually impaired. And so what she did was she took the image of, like, uh, this is uh, Roy, and described where the light was and where it comes down and what part of the picture it was on, and said, when you get to the end of this light, I'm not sure, I can't remember exactly how she described it, but that that's the tip of his nose. And so if you've got very little vision, you see, she tells you, okay, you're, you're looking at somebody in profile. At the end of this brighter pa pattern, it's his nose. And so all of a sudden, they see that that area that they're looking at, okay, that's a nose. And it could bring that image on the panel into focus, so to speak, for the person that's visually impaired. So we were real gratified when we had our first exhibits that there was a gallery filled with blind people that were listening on, we, we started, we didn't have the QR code, wasn't in use then, and, and we had acoustic guides, which are museum guides, and they were listening and looking at our, our work, and I'll tell you, that's, I, I, I'm 
enjoyed that more than any sighted person that's ever looked at our show. Although I do appreciate you seeing <laughs> to, to look at our show. So that was another one of our challenges. And, and we're just going to go through some of the stories of how, um, who the person was, and I'm going to talk about that, and Laurie will inform you what their visual issue was and how she approached uh, the, the illustration that she did. And our first person, and, and we don't have a clicker, so I'll do it like the, child, the film strips in elementary school. Like, <laughs> this is Annie Maxwell, and Annie Maxwell is, became, quickly became one of our heroes. She, is, she was 60 years old when we, when we took her photograph. She did not know she was blind until she was seven years old. She was blind from birth. And when she was seven years old, her, her little brother went off to school, and, and Annie said, well, well, Mom, Mom, I'm not going off to school. And her mother said, well, Annie, you're blind. And she said, I am not. And that was the last time anybody left Annie Maxwell behind. She received, uh, she worked with uh, CBI and, and, and was in charge of their STARS program, which was for children that are blind or visually impaired. And she ran that. It was an award-winning program. It's fantastic. And um, the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation gave her a fellowship. She's the only um, blind person to have received this fellowship. And she uh, and her her um, son was the principal of the school that she went to. <laughs> so so her, her legacy is all over town. Well, and something funny about her, though, is that she raised four children, and they didn't know for a long time that she was blind. He said, um, Willard was her son that was the assistant principal, and he said she, they would be, she would be, he would be driving down the road on the highway, and she would say, you missed your exit, and he'd go, <laughs> Are you seeing something that I didn't know you were seeing? She knew. I mean, she knew. He said it was unbelievable. Yeah, she's a treat. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> and, and Laurie's going to tell you a little bit about what Aunt Annie sees. Well, um, there's no known cause for Annie's vision loss. It was just from birth. Um, her vision is characterized as light perception and contrast vision. So you can't measure her vision in a doctor's office. Um, in bright light, she can see outlines of shapes, and um, she can make out some color distinctions if they vary in tone and value. Um, what was fascinating was that she said if she's walking along, um, she could, if there's a pole ahead or an object ahead, she could sense that it was there because the sound around her changed. And in 2010, Georgetown um, University Medical Center did some studies, and they published their um, results. And they found that people who were blind from birth utilize their um, visual cortex more than sighted people do. The fibers, the neuron fibers and cells in your visual cortex in a blind person, they're there, healthy, just like ours are. But they, the, the cells don't get that visual sensory stimulation, the imagery. So the sound and touch sensory in a, in a blind person activate those in the same visual mm -hmm. cortex part of your brain and heightens it. Mm -hmm. And so when they say that your, your senses are heightened, especially with someone who's blind from birth, it's absolutely true. It's almost like superpowers back there. <laughs> it was pretty fascinating. And so that, just, just the thought of, of walking along and, and just sensing the sound change and knowing that the object was there, that fascinated me about Amy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, this is Ashley Whitley. She was 17, and she was, she was very cool. She, um, she her, the thing that surprised me about what Ashley told us, she's 17 years old. I mean, she's... Uh, in, a, in an age where she's just discovering all her powers and everything, and she said, uh, she, she said that if she uh, was given the opportunity to get her sight back, she's not sure that she would do it because she was a, she she's learned to navigate the world the way she is, and she doesn't know that might be too big a change for her. And I thought that was kind of interesting. I know some people that are deaf, and uh, that's almost like its own culture. They don't even consider it a disability in certain parts of the deaf community. But I've never heard that and, and never heard about it with anybody that was blind. And it was kind of fascinating. But she uh, talked about singing, and we were told she had a really beautiful voice, so we asked her to sing. And, and, and asked her if she would sing for us. And she 
and she sang the Star Spangled Banner. And we were just like, we're knocked out. She has a voice of an angel. But uh, so my part was, was really fun because I got to write their little stories and ask them all kinds of fun questions. And then Aunt Laurie came in to do the real uh, heavy lifting and research. And you can switch it to what Ashley sees, and uh, Laurie will tell you a little bit about that. Yeah, Ashley has Leber's congenital amaurosis, so that's a um, retinal degenerative disease that for um, once it um, deteriorated her retina, her retinas, it, it stayed pretty stable like this. It didn't deteriorate further from this and probably wouldn't um, from what I've read for a while. Her vision um, at this point is 2500. Um, she could distinguish colors pretty easily. Um, again, though, they had to be varying in tone and there had to be um, light. She could make out, you know, like the classmates in a classroom where their hair was or where their face began. Um, she could tell, now with Annie, Annie couldn't always see, when she did see the outlines of shapes, everything was very flat. There, you know, she couldn't tell any depth. And um, with Ashley, there, she could tell that these were three-dimensional objects. There was dimension to the things that she was looking at. Um, but no detail. And so that's like Laurie Clark was talking about, how she wanted to make it relevant to the person. And so she illustrated like the, this being, you know, Ashley's 17, she's in school. How might she see her classmates in a school? And the picture that you saw illustrating Annie was, uh, uh, Annie, I mean, Annie was a, a, a goer and a doer. She was always out and about. And so that's how she might see somebody on a bench outside by a river, which was uh, how she illustrated that. So the next image. This is uh, Cliff Embry. He's, I mean, we've met so many fascinating people. That's the beauty of doing this kind of work, is that you, you enter into lives that you normally wouldn't have an opportunity to enter into, and, and you get to sit down and ask them to tell you their story. It's fascinating. And Cliff Henry was a Tuscaloosa County uh, police officer in Alabama when he was responding with uh, his partner to a domestic violence call. And they had the man outside by the police car, and the woman who had called it in had left. She came back, saw them arresting this man, who was her partner, and she ran over Cliff with her car. And it caused traumatic brain injury. It caused him to go completely blind. The people at Shepherd Center, who have seen a lot, said it was the most traumatic head injury anybody they had ever worked with had survived. But Cliff, oh man, he was a sweetheart. He, his wife was a wonderful person, and, and his story um, is, one of, one of my favorite, most fascinating stories of vision that I've ever heard. Laurie really got, uh, got involved in this one. This is, this is what Cliff's visual experience is. He has something called the Charles Bonnet Syndrome. Um, in 1760, a Swiss naturalist, Charles Bonnet, um, was documenting his grandfather's experience after he had lost his vision from cataract. And his, father, his grandfather, he knew, had you know, perfect mental acuity. There was nothing wrong with him. But he started seeing people walking, animals, patterns, when he knew there was no way his eyes were taking in any light. And so he studied his um, grandfather and did tests. And this is a Charles Bonnet syndrome, which is, if you have been a sighted person, and all of a sudden, that is interrupted. And the brain is not receiving that information anymore. It starts firing random imagery on its own. So for Cliff, he described this black background. It was always there. Um, these green floaters, I'm sure a lot of you have gotten floaters. Well, these are green floaters that would just kind of move around that black background. A gray shadow, almost kind of like the cup of a hand. And then rolling across that visual field would come this cartoon-like um, mesh of body parts. And nothing would like make sense. An arm would just be sticking out of something. Um, and, but it was all very animated. And it, it's always the same image for him. And as I was talking to him, he, he would say, there it goes again. And it would just go rolling across that black bag. And so this is, this is Cliff's visual experience and manifestation of the Charles Bonnet syndrome. It's different for everybody. It can also happen in the elderly when their eyes just start to deteriorate. 
my great aunt, I know, had the Charles Liddy syndrome. Does it always continue, <coughs> or does it eventually diminish? Some? It, it tends, from, from what I can see most of the time, it's there. Once you have it, it's there. Yeah. The brain still keeps firing it away. It still keeps firing Doesn't away. Doesn't give up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then when you wish it would. I read something where there's a theory that those of us who, you know, have vision, that the imagery that we have coming in all the time keeps that brain from sending out images on its own. Now, that was just a theory that I've read recently about the reason. So that, that's clear. This is George, and George, um, uh, as Laurie will go into also, she believes might have this Charles Bunning for her. He's a very creative guy. Um, he spent the first 17 weeks of his life in a hospital um, and had multiple health issues and tumors on his brain. And his mother couldn't bear the responsibility of raising a child with so much trouble and left the family. And his father, George Sr., raised him and and we just adored George Sr. He was with uh, his son all the time, was raising him, had uh, started a successful landscaping business, and, uh, and uh, we, we just thought that was one of, the, one of the things that I was talking about, it's just like amazing people that we got to meet. And Laura will tell you a little bit more about how she did the illustration for George. So George was very shy. He was very hesitant about talking about his experience, um, which, you know, typically most people were eager to talk about it. But he was really, really shy, so we just wanted to give him time. Um, and after a long period of time, he it became clear that he didn't have any light coming in, um, and that he wasn't seeing any of his immediate environment. But toward the end of the, the interview, he started talking that he does see things. And I asked him to describe what they were, and he said they're always ghosty images, very ghosty, just kind of like going across his visual field. And horses, usually soft horses, in this ghosty kind of shadowy way that would just kind of appear and reappear. And, you know, he was, he was young enough where, I, you know, I can't know that that was Charles Bonet. I suspect it probably was, but it would take you know, additional, you know, interviews and tests to determine whether it was or not. But people who have Charles Bonet, even um, younger people, they say tend not to want to tell people that. That they know that they're fine and there's nothing wrong with their mind, but they don't want people thinking they're, they're crazy or there's something wrong. So there are a lot of people who have Charles Bonet that will never know because they have a fear of communicating what, what they're experiencing. Can I answer very quickly that, yeah. was he blind? Birth, it was the brain tumors. So I, mean, I think he could see a little bit so of birth, he, and that's a question whether it was just his imagination. So we, it would just take more talking to him, I think, yeah. to determine whether it was Charles Bonet or what it was. Yeah. Is there any um, uh, similarity in what Charles Bonet people see? The object? Um, some, there is a, a trend that there are miniature things that they see, like miniature people, little miniature leprechauns, or, and someone else that you'll see, um, Helen, has Charles Bonet, she saw miniature bushes with miniature tiny little flowers. But it's, again, that's just a, a trend among some, and in many, there's just, it's just random. And uh, Glenn. that's Glenn Scott, he's 65. Um, he lost his eyesight, but he didn't lose his sense of humor. And uh, his bantering with his wife was, was really funny and, and led to the illustration that Laurie did. So you can, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So his wife would drive him around all the time, <laughs> everywhere. She would, he was talking about how he would watch her as he was driving. So this is, um, a glaucoma diagnosis, which typically, you know, the simulator glasses and all the simulators will tell you that your peripheral vision is going to go away with glaucoma, and it's just going to where you have central vision, and it's going to be a gradual thing. But with Glenn, it didn't happen like that at all. 
it just, everything started to go blurry consistently across his entire visual field, like looking through Vaseline. If you smeared Vaseline on your eyes, that is what it was like. And he could see color, and he could see the outline where a head began, if there was a different color in the background, he could see shapes, but um, no detail at all. Um, it was just like a white cloudy haze. Um, this is Hal, Hal Westmore, and uh, Hal was a gift to me. Uh, about 25 years ago, I did a project that became a book on people with HIV AIDS called Epitaphs for the Living Words and Images in the Time of AIDS, and Hal lost his eyesight due to complications from HIV AIDS. And I was going to shoot him on a Monday. Um, the previous Friday, the Friday before, um, I got a call from Subi at CBI telling me that I might need to contact Hal to see if he still was wanting to keep the appointment because um, something had happened and she wouldn't tell me what it was because she didn't think that it was her place. And so I called Hal, who I'd never met before. He was just, we, we found these people through SUBI and through CDI and, you know, we had just talked about when we could set it up. Well, he said, yeah, yeah, I want to still do it. So, you know, come out on, on Monday when we had decided to do it. So we went out to his house on Monday and he told me that his partner of uh, 25 years had died on that Friday that I called him. And I said, well, Hal, I, you know, I can't believe that you still want to do this. Are you sure you're okay? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, we talked about this. He was so excited because he knew me. I didn't know him. But he had been friends with several of the people that I had photographed. for that project, all of whom died. So he knew all those people in that book and had known about me through that. And he and his partner were, at, you know, I was a connection for them to these friends. And so he, it was, you know, it was like, wow, what a cool thing. So I loved Hal, and um, he's a special guy. He's still going strong, doing well. So Hal um, was diagnosed with cytomegalovirus retinitis and cataracts. And that's a, a, a virus that if, if you're immune suppressed, you're very susceptible to. And so someone with HIV, this is something that um, some are diagnosed with. They're very susceptible to it. Um, and he had no immediate vision of his environment. So his visual experience was this gray kind of cloudy background where it got really dark around the edges. And floaters that were all different stringy kind of curly shapes, he said that uh, were almost like they were suspended in liquid. You could just kind of watch them in liquid floating around. And then he had this orange, red, amber area down in the lower left corner. And this is, this is what he saw all the time. No changes in his case. This is Helen Trinidou, 84 years old, feisty. <laughs> and, um, and we love her. She, she died recently, and her daughter told us how much uh, participating in this project and being able to share her experience meant to her. So that meant a lot to us, and we, we, she, was a, she was garrulous, and uh, had a, she was a gifted conversationalist, I might say. So we had a, a very nice and long conversation with her, and Laurie can tell you a little bit about what she sees.
that are always in the upper left-hand corner of her field. And then in the bottom, teeny tiny little green miniature bushes with teeny tiny little white flowers. They are always there in opposite corners. And she said, she knew that there was nothing wrong with her mind, that this was just happening, but she would just get so irritated. And she'd say, I'd just be walking along, and I'd be like, get out of my way, you butterflies. <laughs> she said, I'm always trying to push them away. She said, and they're, you know, they never go away. Where Cliffs would kind of move across in and out of his field. For Helen, they're just always there, stationary, superimposed over this background. And, and again, to talk about how the right approach to her image for um, Helen is a, is like her a grandchild, Helen and her grandchildren, sitting on a porch swing. So yeah. that's what that's how Laurie illustrated what Helen might see in a normal day. Okay. Uh, this is Henry Hall, and, and we both fell in love with Henry. Henry is Henry's a trip. He's five years old when we took his picture, and we went over and and. Um, I, I had a big microphone, and he's sitting in his mom's lap, and I hand him the microphone, and he puts his hands around, and he's kind of feeling it, and he says, well, you know, Billy, I've never done this before. <laughs> said, no way, Henry, he's five years old. He's never had an interview before with a, with a microphone. And then, and then he said he wanted me to give him just a minute so he could get his brain started. And uh, it got started. I'll tell you. <laughs> never, never really. Quick, quick. You know, when he, when we had our first opening, it was at a downtown gallery that had a big picture window, and Henry loved cars. And he, he came up to me and he said, Billy, what are the cars outside? Because you could see all the cars along the street. And I said, well, well, Henry, there's a Ford truck, and there's a Toyota, and there's, you know, and this and this and this. And I walked away, and this other man came, comes up and stands by Henry and starts talking to him. And Henry, Henry said, well, you know, there's a Ford truck. <laughs> now and and just as a as a, a, a thank you when we were doing these illustrations one of the things Henry talked about was hearing a neighbor with the lawnmower and talking about looking at the guy mowing his lawn so we needed to illustrate that and, and I called our friends Vernon and Susan and their daughter um, <coughs> Meredith right there and, and said Vernon you got a lawnmower and so this this is that man, <laughs> but, but his yard wasn't right, so he's, he's pretending to mow a neighbor's yard, which I would think was probably interesting for the whole neighborhood to see out there, but we appreciate his I'm just glad it wasn't your yard. <laughs> well, that would have been nice. Anything for art. Yeah. We should have done that. So, I'll let Laurie tell you a little about his decision. Henry has retinopathy of prematurity, and so if you're Henry, it's like you're looking through the holes of Swiss cheese. And so, if you if you remembered in the photograph of Henry, he holds his head like this a lot, and and his eyes you'll see that his eyes are looking in a direction. You think he's not looking at you, but he's actually looking at you. He's looking through a pocket that he can see. It looks like he's looking away, but he's just adjusting his head so that he can see what's in front of him when you're standing there. Um, and so, some of these pockets of holes, he can see things closer up and others he can see further back. He can never see detail. Um, yellow is a very dominant color. He can see yellow easier than any other color in this visual field. Um, but that's what it's like to look at Henry's eyes. Okay. Um, this is Luke Putney. He, um, I, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the process. Uh, I mean, it is a photography exhibit as well. And so I, Every time I do a project, one of the first things I figure out is how am I going to shoot it? How is it going to look? Because whatever I choose for the first person has to be consistent throughout. So I have to make some decisions about what kind of equipment and how I want to do it. And this is after I've started shooting digitally and I missed the process that you get with film. And so I went to a more archaic version and shot everybody on four by, a 4x5 four by camera. So it's the kind of camera that you put, uh, you know, you've got a glass uh, plate on the back that you're looking through, everything's upside down, you put a, a blanket over your head so that you can see what you're doing, and, and it's a slower process, and I really enjoyed it because it just slowed me down and allowed me to, to work with my subject to where I was going to photograph, and Luke was a high school wrestler when I photographed him, so he came and he brought his high school wrestling outfit, we put that on, 
and, and I shot it with this Polaroid film that is an inexact science at times, but you pull the, the film apart and instead of, with this particular film, which you can put into a 4x5 camera, instead of just getting the image, the Polaroid image, you get that image, but you also get a negative. And so that negative has more information than the actual image does. The image is the inside of this rough border you see. But your negative is bigger, so it actually has this additional information and it creates this kind of rough um, border to the image, which, which I consider, you know, artsy. So, I, and I like it. I just like it. And, and, it. and it gave it a different kind of feeling to it, and so that's how we did all of these images. And it makes it so they're not all the same. But when I'm photographing, one of the interesting things when I was photographing was I would have to frame the picture with an idea that what I was seeing, um, I was going to get more than that. If I got the picture exactly like I wanted, I'd get too much in my final image and it wouldn't work as well. So I was getting into where I wanted and then I would go in just a little bit tighter and then the entire image. So that's the process. Anyway, Luke is a uh, fantastic guy. He um, went blind when he was really young and his grades went up. And his mother said, well, I can't believe the grades have gone off. Well, yeah, I can't watch TV anymore. <laughs> and, <laughs> Touche. <laughs> and, uh, he is now on a full scholarship at Belmont University. His, his uh, mother is Nancy Hotnot. She works at WABE. She, had saved, she is a really smart, really good person. She saved money to put Luke through college. He got a full ride. She said, this money is for you, Luke. So she bought him, <laughs> she bought him a house. And right, right next. To, I'm sorry, but it's right next to campus, and um, and he is he is a cool guy. He's played and knows Bella Fleck and all of these amazing musicians. Uh, CDI, the Center for the Visually Impaired, has an event every year called the True Blue Do, which is their big fundraising event, and he's going to be one of the musicians uh, play. He's a bassist and a really talented kid, and so that's for me. That's the fun part. And then Laurie's going to take some of those to research. Well, Luke, so. is, Luke is remarkable. I think we're all going to, everyone's going to know about Luke someday. I mean, he's just, he's that extraordinary in person. Mm -hmm. So, I and mean, Luke, being a musician, you know, thought, okay, let's see how he would see another musician that he's playing with, with a guitar. And again, he described to me, you know, I didn't give them any clues, like words to think about. I wanted them to tell me what they were seeing. And he again used the term Vaseline. It was like looking through Vaseline. Um, and his, his vision, he was born um, without any sight in his left eye. But he could see out of his right eye until um, he had an aneurysm that then compressed the optic nerve and then that damaged his right eye. And so this is what he's left with. And a lot of um, a murky kind of light gray field on the left and then a darker gray area in top center and then lower center with dark areas on the left. And then the center and bottom is where the imagery in this environment comes through. And it's very blurred, very soft, no details. And you can see there's pixelization. He kept saying, go in and make it big like pixels because in this one little area, for some reason, I see these pixels. And so he's one of the people that I went back and forth with and said, okay, have I got that right? You know, how do you think this works? And ultimately he said, yep, yeah, that's about it. Right there. Okay. Can I ask you a question? I noticed that a lot of the photographs say uh, the, the yellows are coming out in the orange. So if you were going to be around a person who is visually impaired, would it be beneficial for them in relating, uh, uh, for example, wearing a, a brighter color, mm -hmm. a yellow it, or an orange? Yeah, color. a lighter, brighter color is, is more helpful. I mean, you say that with the elderly, you know? Yeah. Right. No, that's really true. And because, you know, a couple of people said to me, um, and, and especially if there's not a lot of light, everything starts to turn gray. Everything starts to just turn different tones of gray. And it's these colors, the reds, the ambers, the yellows, that really seem to pop out and help them distinguish boundaries of objects. Yeah, yeah that's a good observation. Um, 
we love we love all of these people, and um, we're gonna we'll go through the next few kind of fast. But um, yeah. there there are a few left. This is Mal Wayno. Um, I'll tell you really briefly. He um, he was completely blind. He was the one person that we interviewed that had no pretty much no visual experience. But he was a trip, and he was he was he he had no fear. His mother told us that in their um, little camp at when they taught swimming, he was he was like mainstream, so all the other kids could see. But he was the first person to jump in the pool, he was <laughs> and and so well, and he tried to take us, he work his way around the table and get to us. And are you doing that was our thing. So show. Obviously, that's basically his world, his visual field. Is that? Yeah. You can go to the next one. This is uh, this is Nikki Fry, and Nikki um, Nikki told us an interesting thing. She said that um, it was after she after blindness made her more open to people that she could no longer see people and have these like visual cues that, that might make her, give her some judgment on them. And, and, and she said this thing, and I just keep with me. She said, now I see their hearts first. Whoa, what, a, what an amazing thing to see. And she got training and became a massage therapist. So how perfect is that? She uses her hands, she sees people's hearts first, and a uh, very special person. And, and she had an interesting visual experience. She did. She had cataracts that led to um, detached retinas. And so she has one little area where she can see vision in the lower left corner. Um, so a foot might pop out as she's walking along the street. But she described this, this varying gray background in a feather-like brush stroke that goes down at an angle, ending at the lower left part of her visual field with a little area where her environment can be. And uh, this is Phil Green. He is the friend that I told you about that was uh, the inspiration and the anchor for us doing this project in the first place. And, and uh, it was, we actually used him as sort of a consultant on the project to make sure that what we were doing was something that would resonate with the visually impaired community. So he's been helpful throughout the whole process. And they, uh, Sydney retired from the CDI and they've moved to Fort Worth. But I, I would encourage all of you, if you're interested in these issues, uh, to get in touch with CDI, and if you're, if you just have somebody that you know that has a visual impairment, or, or if you struggle at all, the CDI uh, it's downtown on West Beach Street, and right past the Bell South or Southern Bell or AT and T or whatever the building is now, um, they they gave them a beautiful building, it was really really great, and uh, they have a store called Visibility, and it has all the coolest things for people with low vision that you can imagine. It has, it has toys, it has, I don't know if you've ever heard of beat baseball, but beat baseball is a baseball that's got a beeper in it. And so they play baseball. And, and you have to, you, you pitch it, you hit it, and you, and you have to catch it or, or find it and get the person out all by listening for where the, where the ball is. And, and so they, you know, they've got just a ton of things you wouldn't even think about. But if you, if you have or have somebody in your family that suffers from low vision, it's a toy store. All of it is great. You know, it's got all kinds great devices and cutting edge things, but also just an old, you know, it's got reading glasses and all kinds of stuff. It's a cool place to be. Very neat. And, and uh, so you can go to what Phil sees, which isn't much. Yeah, Phil has retinitis pigmentosis and macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. And when I was talking to Phil, you know, he doesn't have any peripheral vision at all. It's all going down to the central area and the central vision where environment peeks through. And when I asked him, is it gray, is it black? And he said, no. It's not gray, it's not black, there's no noise, it's just gone. He said, it's just vanished. And he said then within that central, he said again, he used the word Vaseline again, and then there were little areas of again, just blank areas, and everything else that you know, could peek through was just um, blurred. Okay, well this is Raina. We told you a little bit about Raina, but she lives in a small Georgia town. She's uh, Chinese and she has albinism, so she has no pigment. She's blonde, a little blonde, cute as all get out, very feisty. We've used feisty before, but a lot of these people are. Some of it by necessity and part of it, that's the way that they have survived. And uh, she is like the town 
a celebrity. Everybody knows Raina. And, and I tell you, the 4x5 camera is a slow process. So you are, it, it's not, you ain't gonna shoot sports with this camera. And, and you set it up, you set your person up, and, and you take their portrait, and you get them right where they are, you focus. I, I do very near depth of field, so I want them right on this plane where I can get it all in focus. But when you're taking pictures of a feisty little uh, Chinese <laughs> albinism, and, you know, girl, and she's like, Billy, what's this? What's that? Well, like this. I, I got a bunch of pictures where uh, she ain't in the picture. You know? And so, so I actually, that was part of her to me, was, was that. And, and so going out of the frame was a part of the image to me of, of Raina. And we loved her, and her family was superior. I mean, they went to China um, and found out that they could not, it was going to be difficult to hire a, a healthy child. But they found out it wouldn't be difficult if they took a child that had special needs. And the, the mother had grown up with this kid that had albinism, and he was a friend of hers when she was a kid, and she didn't see that was a big deal. So, so she thought Raina, well, actually, she started to adopt Raina's brother. Uh, he became really ill, wasn't available, they adopted Raina. They went back a year later, her brother was doing better. They, they adopted him and brought him back, too. They're special, special people. We met a lot of special people. I've said that. <laughs> so this is Raina, and um, as she would look at her dog, Raina um, not only moves around a lot, but she doesn't have distant vision, she only has close-up vision. So when she wants to see something, she gets right on top of it. So when you meet Raina, she'll do this to you. She'll come up and she'll put her forehead in your forehead, <laughs> because she wants to get as close as possible to see you. Um, and then things start to get clearer, um, but everything is pretty blurry. Um, she has contrast vision, and she can see a little bit of depth and color. Okay. Last but not least, uh, this is Stan Thurman, and he's uh, 56 when we photographed him. He had lost his right eye from a, uh, getting it poked out when he was a 10-year-old kid. But then, uh, as an adult, he started losing a sight in his left eye. But he was a, he was a advocate for people that were blind. And, and said that he, he fought against stereotypes and said that, uh, well, his quote was, our minds are still sharp, our spirits are strong, we're contributing members of society. And that's all they wanted was to still have an opportunity to contribute. And uh, so that's something that we want, that's a thought we wanted to leave with. And Lauren can tell you a little bit about what Stan had to say and then um, if you have any questions. So Stan, yeah, he lost his um, vision in his right eye due to the trauma. Then, um, as he got older, he um, developed diabetes. And he had blood vessels burst in his other eye. And so that's how he lost the vision in his other eye. And so this is, you know, Stan was sitting across from someone in a, you know, a restaurant or a cafe. This is what he would see. There's red that, that he can see from bleeding and from the blood vessels in his eye. Um, almost no vision on the right. Everything else is very blurred with dark floaters that start moving around. And he said what was interesting is that if his blood pressure rises, his vision deteriorates. <coughs> if he can alter that, he started altering that really, he, he started with his diet, with exercise, everything he could do to keep his blood pressure down and his vision would get better. So he is managing his blood pressure and although this is probably about the best he can hope for visually, this is how he sees. So thank you all for your patience for listening through all of this. <laughs>
amazing artist. And there's one thing I want to say about that kind of art. There, there is a, a genre that sort of is called, you know, uh, disabled disability art, art by people that are dis disabled. Uh, well, it's it's even different from that, yeah. and and it, it's 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 narrowing it down to oh, this is art, but it's by somebody that's disabled. So it gives it this sort of uh, moniker that is inaccurate. Uh, he is an artist. And there's another person that I've photographed that's an artist named David Sampson, and, and he has cerebral palsy it's a, it was for a different project. And he was not a disabled artist or a disability artist. He was an artist. And he said that he started doing art because he couldn't climb trees. So it's a fascinating, you know, it's, 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 it's really about being open to different people's experiences and seeing the world in, in, in the case of the art uh, by Alan, it's seeing the world through somebody's eyes that, uh, that has a very different visual experience than you do. We all have a different experience in so many different ways, but that's the exciting thing about doing what we can do.